Now, in the United States, the Supreme Court has revived a key Biden immigration policy, handing the president a major victory. The ruling allows the administration to prioritize which undocumented immigrants to deport. Journalist Dexter Filkins has much more about America's perennial immigration crisis in his recent article, Biden's Dilemma at the Border. And he's joining Walter Isaacson to discuss what he's witnessing. Thank you, Chris John and Dexter Filkins. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Man, you've covered Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. And now for The New Yorker, you've written this very detailed, very nuanced piece about the southern border of the United States with Mexico. What drew you there? Well, I, I was just, I was struck by, I was struck by the chaos, really, and also, and also the level of disagreement in, in the country about what was actually happening. So, you know, if you, if you read the New York Times in the morning, uh, that gives you one picture. And then, but then if you go to Tucker Carlson, uh, you know, formerly of Fox, he was on every night with with a completely different picture, and I, I was sort of struck by that. And I thought, so so I went into that story with with a with a pretty simple question, which was just how many people are getting in and how many people are getting sent back out. You know. But you also came up with an answer that it has truly transformed towns and places along this two thousand mile border. It was very rich in detail in that. Were you surprised, because uh, I'm down here in Louisiana, we kind of know, but most people in this country, were you surprised that they don't know how transforming this is? I, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's begun to touch the cities in the Northeast. But gosh, if you, if you live in Texas, down on the border, it's, it is transformative. I mean, that's the word. And so you have, you have towns like Del Rio, where, where literally tens of thousands of people have moved through there in the past two years. Like I think in Del Rio, it's a city of about 40,000 people, they've had about 80,000 people come through their town. So if you could just imagine your own neighborhood, legions of people coming through on, on the, and, the, and, and they don't stay typically, they, you know, they move on out, but it's just this kind of constant stream of people. Speaking of Del Rio, you talked to the mayor, now the former mayor, there and it was just a very surprising conversation. He gets phone calls. Tell us about you know. Give us a narrative because your piece is very much a narrative piece. Well, so the the mayor, the former mayor of, of uh, Del Rio, is a guy named Bruno Lozano. He's a Democrat. He's gay. He's he's uh, he's a, he's a flight attendant for Delta. Actually, it's a, I mean, the, being the mayor there is supposed to be a part time job. And he said uh, this just a couple of years ago, uh, twenty twenty one. He got a phone call from the Border Patrol and they said, hello, um, we think in the next, you know, by Friday, <laughs> in the next four or five days, you're going to have about 10,000 people moving into your city. And, you know, he said, I just fell out of my chair. Um, he said, hold on a minute, you <laughs> 10,000 people. And it turned out, it turned out it was 16,000 people moved into Del Rio in the course of about a week. And so they're they, they tried to, the Border Patrol, which only had four or five agents there, and that, and that you know, you've got to try to picture that. Um, these people are just moving across the border. There was some rumor, and that, that's how these things happen. There was a rumor that went around that the, the, you're going to be let in, and so people just came. 16,000 people, most of them from Haiti, who'd been living in South America for a number of years, but they decamped under a bridge. Um, and so suddenly overnight, there's a city of 16,000 people under a bridge. There were babies being born. They had to find ways to feed them. And so the mayor, the, the mayor just basically had a breakdown. Um, you know, he said, I, what, what, what am I to do as the mayor? This, the city is now, my city is now ungovernable. I was in El Paso and Brownsville in the past month or so. And it, it was somewhat stunning to just see the border people. And then you got the feel that the politics, as you just said, is changing. It was almost like the air is changing in a political sense. What did you see about the changing politics? Well, I, I, the, the, I, I, spent, a, I spent a couple of days with uh, one of the congressmen from the area named Tony Gonzalez. He's actually, he's actually a moderate Republican uh, in the, the district, which is he's got a couple hundred miles on the border. So he deals with this problem all the time. It's very real for him. But he's actually a he's actually a moderate Republican, and and he 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 does not support 
the more draconian measures that the Republican Party supports. But he's in, in very much the same way, he feels like I, when I went around to him, for instance, we, we sat down with a couple of ranchers and, you know, there's just big sprawling ranches in South Texas and in West Texas, thousands of acres. Migrants are moving through there. They're cutting the fences. Their livestock are getting free. They're trampling all over the place. They find backpacks, you know, with fentanyl in them. These people were angry at him, and they and they said, you know, what are you going to do? You know, what what uh, we need we need results. And and you know, what can you say as a congressman, except uh, you know, we're working on it. Um, but he could barely say that, you know. And he's a Republican, and the the you know the administration is Democratic, so he can you know he can barely get in the front door. So it it's it's basically paralyzed. It's basically paralyzed the local politicians. They're but you got Congressman Gonzalez, moderate Republican. You say it used to be back in 2010, 2012, even leading to the 2013 bill that passed the Senate and failed the House, that there was hope of bipartisanship. Can Gonzalez find any bipartisan things he can do, or would he just be shunned by the Republican Party if he tried? And I think that's the tragedy here. Is that is that. You can sort of imagine a compromise. It's not that difficult. Basically, the the Republicans want better border security. You know, they want more walls, more border guards, and the and the Democratic Party wants kind of more legal pathways for people to come, kind of making an orderly process. Some of the most interesting conversations I had were with people who said that what happened was, I mean, first the that bill in 2013 that came very close to passing, it passed the Senate, died in the House, basically killed by the Tea Party. That the Republican Party was changing essentially, and then when Trump came in, instead of kind of you know how do we find the right language for this bill, it became something entirely different, which was we can't let any immigrants in. These, this isn't just a problem; these are bad people, um, and it completely changed the complexion. Was of that life. because of Trump's rhetoric, which was really inflammatory, racist in a way about Mexican Americans and rapists? Yes. And I, you know, I had an interesting conversation. She's, she's actually not quoted in the piece, but very interesting woman, Linda Chavez, who worked for the Reagan administration. And she she told me that she often goes around the country and gives a speech in which she says, we need immigrants for the economy. She said, forget about the humanitarian argument. This is about self-interest. We need them. And she said, I give that speech everywhere. And, you know, people to so the chambers of commerce all over the country, people are applauding at the end of it. 2015, when Trump became a candidate, the reception that she got to that same speech just changed markedly. You know, she said, I, I practically had to run out of the room in some of these places. People's views of immigrants, particularly among Republicans, began to change very drastically. And I, so I think that's contributed to it. Well, let's talk about Biden for a second. You called your piece is titled Biden's Dilemma at the Border. Why is it a dilemma? What is the dilemma? I, I think there's a dilemma for him in in the party and and i think i tried to describe this in the in the in the piece the during the campaign biden gave a number of speeches in which he said what what president trump is doing on the border is inhumane um he, you know he's enacted these draconian programs and he's giving america a bad name around the world and we're going to take those programs we're going to we're going to tear them down and they did they went into office and they took down all of all of President Trump's programs. Remain in Mexico, the transit ban, these things that were that were set up to try to control the enormous flow of people, the daily flow that is coming in. And what's happened, um, and I and I I think that Biden was led to that point by by the by the left wing of his party. I think. And say. you say that he invited a lot of those progressives on immigration to be his policy team initially, right? Yeah, Has there been some change? Yes, and that, that's, what's been, that's been so interesting to track over the past couple of years. So basically what happens is Biden comes in, you know, basically uh, with the left wing of his party, they take down all of Trump's programs and what happens? We get this incredible surge of people so that over the past two years, depending on how you count, it's a little difficult. About four million people have come across the border and into the United States. I mean, you know, that's that's bigger than a lot of states. And this is not sustainable. By it's not sustainable economically, politically, anything. It's it's too much. Um, you know, there's seventy thousand migrants in in New York City, living in hotels. Um, it's costing it's cost a billion dollars already. And I think B Biden came to that realization. 
And so what's happened is, is that you're watching over the over just the last six months, the policies change. And it, what's really remarkable to me, um, and I say this without irony, what's, what's happening basically is that by, the Biden administration is erecting uh, policies which look remarkably like President Trump's. And so they're kind of- Really? What do you mean by that? I mean, is, is he gonna build a wall? <laughs> yeah, well, may, not not he hasn't gone there yet. Although you know that's that's the irony here is that there's so much wall on the border, built by President Obama, built by President Bush, you know, and then again, sort of Trump comes in and everything becomes like very very polarized. But you know that's interesting on the polarization around the wall too, because when I read your piece, one little thing that struck me is there's a lot of wall and it actually worked. It stops the people there. And yet it seems so difficult for so many Americans. Give me your take there. It's, it's really true. The wall, the, the wall, there's so much wall. And, and in, fact, in fact, I went to a press conference of Congressman Gonzalez's and he was talking about it. We were right on the Rio Grande. And as I was leaving the press conference, I, I watched like six people come over the wall. They climbed right over. I mean, it, you know, it was difficult to climb over the wall, but it slows them down. It kind of channels them. It works. I, I think... I think it, you know, there's a lot of that border, hundreds of miles that are in the middle of nowhere, and it, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to put a wall there. Um, but what's remarkable is, again, like Obama built a lot of wall, George W. Bush built a lot of wall. There was a kind of consensus about it, you know, there was this kind of growing consensus that we can't control the border anymore. Um, and then, you know, we have the politics of today where all that's blown up, and there's no consensus on any of this. You quote a border agent saying what I think a lot of Americans of all political stripes, Democrats and Republicans feel, which is the border is wide open. Now, you talk about four million people coming in, but that also seems wrong. Is it wide open? It's, it's not wide open. That, uh, that's not the, it's not the way to put it. Um, a lot of people are coming in, but what uh, it's it's almost a, it, it it really is a kind of perfect it, it's a it's a it's a perfectly unsolvable problem. I mean, Congress could solve this, but but as it is, it's it's a kind of very jerry rigged system that doesn't work. But basically, of the four million people that I that I tried to count uh, who who have come in in the past two years, about two and a half million of them, most of them, have come in and and basically you, the way the law is written and has been written for decades. You can get your foot on American soil and you can ask for asylum. So it's not legal to cross the border, but if you're in America and you say, I will be persecuted if I go back to Venezuela, I will be persecuted if you send me back to Tajikistan, people from Tajikistan across the border. It is the legal obligation of the United States to not to send those people back. That's the biggest loophole that exists in American immigration law. Wait, 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 you're calling it a loophole, but we're talking about yeah, asylum. <laughs> And yes. asylum is something, especially after World War II, we said, yes. okay, this defines us as America. We give asylum to the oppressed. How did that become what you just called a loophole? And that, that's the tragedy here, because I, I, just, I just called it a loophole. And in fact, it is, the, it is the, we are a haven of last resort for people around the globe. And, you know, that's a, that's a you know, we're all proud of that. I mean, that's, that's, a great, that's a great American thing. We as Americans should be proud of that. But it's it's become essentially it's it's basically out of control. I, I think is the is the I think both sides would agree because this. Well, give me an example of it being out of control. There are a couple in your piece. Even uh, there's one person, let me say, who because of sexual orientation has trouble getting a job and yes. problems with the family, and so wants asylum in the U.S. I could feel both sides of that one. Explain uh, how we think that through. Absolutely. And I, so, so you, you come across the border, you get a very brief interview, just like a minute and a half uh, to establish, does this person, does this person have a credible fear of persecution if he or she returns home? And if, if, if you make it over that bar, that's a pretty low bar. Um, you're in, you are in America for at least four or five years and possibly a decade. You can string your case out. That's a decade to work. You can send money home, um, you know, with luck, you'll get in. And and so that that's the problem is that I think there's a there's a growing sense that the asylum system 
as well-intentioned as it is, as noble a system as it is, is being gamed, at least to a certain So how would you fix it? Well, I, I think the way to fix it is to like hire a lot more immigration judges and put them down on the border so that now when you come in, you have to wait four or five years to get your case figured out. Um, and so the, the whole thing kind of falls apart. You know, where where are you? Like where, this person we let across the border, is he, is he in Denver? Is he in Detroit? Is he in New York? Like nobody knows. And so what you need to do is like, and everybody, everybody anyone would tell you this, um, have a bunch of judges on the border who can who can go through these cases, if not immediately, then very quickly, basically, and determine who's telling the truth and who's not. And 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 that that that's that would be very expensive, and that's the problem. It comes back to Congress. You you say in your piece, much of the migration of the United States in recent years has been driven by profound developments and developments in Central and South America, where economic turmoil, drug-related murders, natural disasters have brought uh, many states to the brink of collapse. To what extent is it out of the Biden administration's control, and what can be done about that? Well, that's like. It's like a super good question. It's, it's and, th and this is what you see when you go to the border. There are so many people coming every day, thousands of people every day. They're so desperate. I mean, they're genuinely desperate. They are fleeing. They are fleeing countries, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Cuba, whether it's Haiti, whether it's Nicaragua. They're in a state of collapse. There are no jobs. They're not safe. They can't send their children to school. They're all looking for better lives. You know. So, and really, the way to look at it is sort of. Yeah, they're seeking asylum, but what they really, mo what most of them really want are better lives. But but the problem is, is that the conditions are generating this. They're generating the migration. And so, what do you do? How do you fix Venezuela? It, it's been in a state of collapse for years. It, it's already produced seven million refugees. They're all over South America, Nicaragua the same, Haiti the same, Cuba the same. What can we do? And so. The Biden administration is trying. I mean, they're they're trying to sort of set up. You know, they've gener they're trying to generate business investment, and they're trying to fix the economies and the political systems of South and Central America. But, I mean, that's not a short term thing. I mean, that that's not a, that's not a quick fix. Like that's going to take that's going to take years. I mean, you know, we've you know we've tried that in other parts of the world, and like, it's hard. You know, and and but that's that's the thing, which is that. They're coming every day, and they're fleeing those collapsing states. Dexter Felkins, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.